Hi everybody, thank you very much for having us here at uh, Gymposium today. Uh, this is my first Gymposium and I'm loving it. Um, Nicholas very kindly gave us the title of Gordon's Alive. I am not going to do it, but if anybody else, feel free. Come on, like pep us up before coffee. If anyone wants to have a go, then uh, on you go. Um, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the history of Gordon's and it's particularly special this year because it is our 250th birthday this year for Gordon's Gin. And then I'm going to hand over to Terry who is our master distiller. So Gordon's Gin is 250 years young as we like to think of it. Um, but first, just a little bit about me and the role that I have at Diageo, because some of you might be sitting there thinking, what is an archivist? That's just like the weirdest title ever. Um, so I like to think of myself as Diageo's um, gins and malts historian and archivist, which I think helps a little bit more. So at the Diageo archive, we have the world's spirit, uh, largest spirits archive in the world. So if we laid everything that we had out side by side, it would take up the same space as 55 football pitches. So the collections are huge. Um, they date from the 1740s right the way up to whatever we are producing today. We have a real responsibility to safeguard the archive going forward. And the great thing for me is that it's not just a nice thing to have for Diageo. We do actually leverage the archive every day in everything that we do. So we really do root everything that we do in authenticity and from a place, a place of something very real. And it's not just records that we have, it's not just the paper records. We also have a huge packaging collection, which you can see behind me here. This is our liquid library. You are all very welcome to come and visit. Um, this room, you will be surrounded by 5,000 of our historical bottles. They date from the 1880s right the way up to, again, whatever we're producing today. Those Smirnoff bottles are in there, and I am proud that those Smirnoff bottles are in there. So <laughs> everything's important. Um, but some of the bottles that we do have in there are incredibly rare and incredibly valuable because they will be the only ones of in the world. They also have the original spirit in them, so we don't empty anything out and refill it. So if there's liquid in the bottle, it's the original liquid. And yes, the cupboards are locked. <laughs> you can't get in. But Gordon's, and where did it all begin? So it starts with this handsome man here. This is Alexander Gordon, our founding father. So he established his distillery actually only two miles from here, I've been told, um, in Goswell Road in 1769. And he was one of the first to do this at a time where gin really was recovering from the era that we now all know as gin madness. So at that time, let's have a think. Oxford Street's the largest slum in Europe. Um, in London, one in four properties are distilling gin, and it's crude, and it's bad. And the average adult is consuming three litres of that a week. So it's causing a lot of problems. The death rate is outstripping the birth rate, and things aren't good. So the government decide that they need to change this. So in 1751, they introduced the Tippling Act, and that really begins to change things for gin. And it means that people like Alexander Gordon step in and really do turn things around for the industry. And they really are at the forefront of dragging gin out of the gutter and making it something very respectable again. And we know that Alexander always had quality at the heart of everything that he did because of the records that we have in the archive. So the letter that you can see here is the earliest thing that we have in the archive collection for Gordon's. Um, again, it dates to the 1770s. And in this letter, what I can see is that Alexander Gordon isn't content with create, um, sourcing his raw botanicals from London or even the UK. He's looking as far afield as continental Europe to make sure that he is getting the best quality ingredients that he needs to make the best gin that he can. And that attention to detail and quality is something that we're really proud to continue with the work that we do today. We then move on to the 1830s and Alexander Gordon and co create their first London dry gin. And this is the oldest bottle that we have in the archive of the London dry gin. And the big thing for me is, you look at that bottle now, you then look at the bottles that sits alongside, and there is a huge amount of consistency in that pack. We were talking about packaging design. Um, so you can see here that even from that earliest bottle from the 1900s, right the way up to our current Gordon's Gin bottle, you would instantly recognize them. And that's something that's really important to us as well. But where were we making this stuff historically? So as I said, not far from here, 
So we were at Goswell Road, and we were there from the 1700s right the way through to the 1980s. And by the end of our time there, we actually owned pretty much the whole street. Um, there was warehousing on one side and packaging, and then the offices and the production process on the other side. And the reason that they chose that location, it's very simple. We got some really good water there, so that really, really helped. We had to be there because we needed the water. You can't make gin without water. The other great thing for us was it was a really easy place to get our botanicals in, but also to get our gin out. So it meant that it was very easy for us to export around the world. And by the 1800s, Gordon's really was everywhere. This is just another sneak peek inside a part of the, the distillery as well. So, as you can see here, right from the word go, we're looking at different botanicals, ingredients that we can use to make our gin. And in actual fact, if you go back there, that's a distillery in the 1950s, really so similar to the distillery that we, that we have today. And Old Tom, one of our oldest stills, is hiding in that picture as well, just behind the first one. And as we've talked about a lot today, the desire to experiment with different ingredients, botanicals, and flavors is nothing new for us. So I love the fact that whenever somebody comes to me and is saying, oh, Joe, we've got this amazing new idea, I'm like, yeah, okay, we've done that before. I am that person that gets to turn around and say, yeah, we've done that before. Um, but it's fantastic because as far back as our records go, we can show that Gordons have always been experimenting with different flavors, botanicals. They have continually wanted to create something new and exciting, to give people the flavors that they want to drink. And that's the one thing that we love to do today. But the great thing for me is that it means that whenever we look to do this today, we do it with Gordon's real authenticity at its heart. So when I work with Terry and other people in this room to see what we can do next for Gordon's, it always starts from a place of authenticity. And it starts with the recipes that we have in the archive, which are probably the one thing that we use the most within our gins collection. And we're very lucky to have them. The other thing that I love is that Gordon's have always been around making sure that their gin is accessible to everyone. So these are probably the, my favorite bottles in the whole archive collection. If anybody comes up, these will be the bottles that I stand you in front of and go, aren't these lovely? Let's bring them back. Diageo, let's bring them back. Um, so these are our um, ready to drink shaker cocktail range. Can anybody guess the year that these were launched? I'm gonna have a go. Ne oh, you're quiet. 1924, yeah. 1924, Gordon's released one of the first ever ready to drinks. Isn't that amazing? So the whole point was, everybody's wanting to throw cocktail parties, but nobody knows how to make a cocktail. So Gordon's takes that complication away and that whole uh, ethos of making sure that they are bringing enjoyment and accessibility to everybody. They say, do you know what? We'll take that step away from you. We'll make you an expertly made cocktail, so all you have to do is open and pour. And that was the creation of the Gordon's Shaker cocktail range. And they're beautiful. Also, Tankery stole our bottle. And that leads us on to today. We're talking about, again, just making gin and tonic accessible, and we do that with our RTD cans today. Perfect, who said we drink gin on the train? That was another Scottish person, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, this is our version of, of those today. This is, what we're, this is what we're good at. You know, it's about making that accessible drink that everyone can just open, pour, and enjoy. The one thing as well, um, that I love about Gordon's is that this brand is fun. It really is fun. And um, you can see this um, document here behind me. This is the Gordon's uh, Cocktail Chorus. Dates from the 1930s. And it's probably my favorite thing in the whole archive collection. So this is again, as if you're throwing a cocktail party, you would take out your cocktail chorus. Somebody would ask you for a cocktail. You would spin the wheel around to the right place. You'd get a little comment in the box that I'm not gonna read out because there's a few Diageo lawyers in the room um, and it's very of its time. Um, but within the notes uh, of that cocktail chorus there, you get the ingredients for your cocktail. So a really clever tool to make sure that everybody is enjoying their drinks as they want to with their friends. A big part of the archive collection is also our advertising. 
So for Gordon's, um, they really began advertising back in the 1910s. So they were quite early in doing so. And if you look at the early, one of the earliest adverts here at the top on the left, really stunning adverts. I mean, look at that. Then you go through some of the key ones that I've pulled out here, and you can see that what's always been consistent is the bottle, cocktail, enjoyment, and quality. So that's been a big thing, but all done with this Gordon's cheeky tone and voice, which I absolutely love. And you can see from the adverts that I've got up here where the inspiration from our current Shall We campaign has come from. So again, this is about Gordon's using the archive to make sure that they're creating something today which is incredibly true to everything that's at the heart of Gordon's. So Gordon's Gin for me is very much a brand that's about enjoyment, sociability and innovation. But all that we do has to have authenticity at the heart and it also has to come from some great quality, well-made spirit. And so to talk to you more about that, I'm going to hand you over to Terry, our master distiller. Afternoon, everybody. Um, this is actually my first symposium. Uh, I'm really kind of delighted to be here. Uh, dealing with a big brand, as, as Gordon says, it's, it's sometimes hard to get with the distilleries. So uh, this is probably an unusual situation for me to be here. But I'm really kind of uh, really amazed by some of the kind of the presentations we've had and the people that's been behind and so passionate behind gin, which which I am, and hopefully it's come through the presentation as well. So a wee bit about me, so because people have not really kind of seen much of me. And one thing I'm also very, very proud to actually, and quite humble to actually be standing here uh, on a year of 250 years of Gordon. So I find that quite humble. So I have got 36 years uh, industry experience, and um, I've actually got a real connection with the Gordons and the Tankery brands. Uh, and, and that came whereby my first, kind of, my first job, actually, uh, was involved with the brand, and uh, that was more on the packaging side. So I've probably, kind of, I've probably done a reverse of what people, a lot of people do in their career. They maybe kind of start at the front end of the, of the process, which would be distillation, and then maybe work their th way through packaging. I've actually done the reverse of that. Uh, so, but I did for a kind of period of 10 years, uh, sorry, 20, 25, 26 years, uh, I moved into the whiskey side of the business. And... Uh, Real involved that heavily uh, from, say, very young age, uh, right through kind of whisky maturation, blending, and also coopering as well. So, so I've got kind of extensive kind of experience within that, uh, that side of the business. Uh, and it was probably during that time uh, that I was there that uh, it became apparent that I had a, a real ability in nosing. Uh, and picking up characters of all the various whiskies. Uh, see, I was always out there in the blending hall at the various casks, and, and, uh, and I love to just get in there and be nosing all the different kind of characters of the casks. So, uh, and I actually went on to be uh, a group of four people uh, who passed every single blend uh, that they were actually were producing with their, their whisky casks, and that was the, the seller's company at that time. Um, within my role for the last 10 years, I say managing the, 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 the Gordons and, and Tankery Distillery, um, it's, uh, it's, it's very varied, and that's what I love about the role. Uh, I'm involved with uh, the, the innovation teams, which is great to see a few of them here today, and um, the, 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 the marketing people, um, right through to the, the, the whole kind of quality side, the whole distillation process, and dealing with the raw ingredients as well, all the botanicals. So uh, I, say, I, I do love, uh, love my role, and hopefully, again, that comes across. So, I suppose the big thing, when I was putting this presentation together, people was wanting to know, what is the recipe behind Gordon? So, why is, it, why is it such a big brand? Why is it so successful? So, I've kind of sort of shared a wee bit about myself, a bit of background, uh, and uh, but so, yes, I'd like to go in and, and tell you, well, what is that recipe? You know what the recipe is? For me, the first thing, the first component of the recipe, it's all about passion. And see those people there? Uh, they're, they're the people to this day that, that kind of stand uh, right behind the brand, very committed uh, and uh, put a power of work in every day. They're, they're focused on protecting that brand, protecting the quality uh, is, is, is phenomenal from the innovation team as again, marketing team, uh, the people who procure their, their ingredients along with myself and, um, and, and to produce a, such a, a a massive gin uh, is, 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 is absolutely kind of fantastic and I do find that very humbling. So these are some of my team members there and, and, and some of my colleagues as well. So the distillation team, um, you see them at the top there, that's, that, they're the, the, the current distillers. 
Uh, there are only six of us um, that, uh, that know the, the Gordon's recipe uh, to this day. Uh, obviously, previous people, but currently uh, doing the, the day in, day out job, there's only, there's only six of us know that. So, so between us, the, the group up there, 150 years industry experience, uh, some people with 25 years uh, plus um, uh, service, um, range of um, skill levels. Uh, some, uh, one guy on the left there, he was actually one of, he's the last original distiller uh, who had the knowledge transfer from Landon when the plant was in Landon before it moved up to Scotland in, in 1999. Uh, there's two in that uh, up there who had whisky experience as well, so whisky distillation experience, and, uh, and also one who was actually involved with coppers, the coppersmiths. So a varied, a, a varied uh, uh, amount of knowledge. When I think about the training that goes in with these guys, uh, now there's the two in the very end there uh, who have only been there maybe a year, one guy, only just a few months, uh, who, who's currently in his training. Now, we don't take that lightly. And for me, it's very important that we keep the, the, the kind of tradition, the heritage of the brand uh, as it's been passed all the, all, the, all the way back 250 years from Alexander Gordon. We keep kind of carrying that all the way through. Uh, so it isn't just a, it's not a month on the job, it's not a three month on the job. These guys take, guys or ladies take nine to 12 months to actually, for their training. Uh, and they will not be left to go in any still and run those stills uh, until they've been through that and they're actually signed off uh, and approved by myself to do that. So, we've chatted about, about the people now. Um, so I'm going to tell you what actually goes in Gordon's. Um, that's what probably everybody's wanting to know. Um, we do have a brand that's, that's, that's great. Uh, as I say, it's been there 250, year, 250 years. And for me, what's behind that brand and how it's, how it's been so, so good all that time is that we've made, maintained the, the, the core principles behind the brand. Uh, and that's, re that's really key. And what that is, that's about quality. It's quality, quality, quality. It's, it's, it's what's in my books. The focus on Gordon's quality is really paramount. Um, even before a juniper berry actually hits the still, um, it's all about making sure that the, the, the kind of unique characters there all, all the way through that. And it's about sticking to the original uh, principles when we're doing distillations as well. Because at the end of the day, Gordon's is the genest of gins in, 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 my, in my book. Four ingredients. So yeah, the dominant one, juniper, coriander, angelica root, and also licorice as well. So that's quite widely out, out there in the media. Uh, but I thought I'd just kind of confirm that that's the, these are the four uh, ingredients that go into, into producing Gordons. And I'll, cover, I'll, I'll touch on the ingredients a bit more later on in the, in, in the presentation. Uh, but there's probably one thing, uh, I want to take the opportunity whilst I'm here, um, and I know we had uh, Tommy and Michael up there earlier on there, uh, but there's one thing, and I think a lot of the distillers in here, if it, they probably, and hopefully I'm not speaking out of turn here, but uh, I'd like to kind of personally thank uh, on behalf of us the, the work that goes in. I've had the opportunity to go out to, to Tuscany uh, a few years back there, and I know it's very hard work there. You saw the video that was up there earlier on there with the, the guy beating the juniper, bush, the juniper berries off the bush. I look in the botanical store and I look at one 40 kilogram bag of juniper, and now I can appreciate the effort and the work that goes into producing one. So, so I don't think we should, I, I probably see the botanical suppliers as unsung heroes in the whole kind of gin, gin business. So it's a personal kind of thank you from me and, and the other ones that's in, in this room. So where does the magic happen? The magic actually happens in, in, in three, three countries across the world. Uh, so we've got Scotland, uh, we've got a site in Canada, and we're also producing South Africa as well. Um, Cambridge Distillery, uh, that is the largest, and that serves markets in the UK, Ireland, uh, Italy, South Africa, and, and Argentina. So there's a little nice picture there. Uh, I could have put a picture of the, the gin distillery up, but it was a, a nice one with the river leaving running through. So, so the site itself is, uh, is based in a, in a small village called Windigates, so it's in Fife. And, um, the site has been there since, uh, since 1824. Uh, within the site, uh, there's a, we have the largest grain producing distillery uh, in Europe, uh, and, the, and the tankery distillery sits within the site as well, uh, and that was moved from Landon in, in, in 1999. Um, the river water there, it's the river Leaven that's running through there. We don't draw that water for any of our, uh, our, um, uh, to, to put in the stills. That's purely, we do draw from the river uh, for cooling purposes, so for cooling the, the head of the still and also the condensers as well. So the stills, I spoke about stills earlier on there, I was talking about stills, um, and yeah, we wouldn't appreciate Jennifer if they have stills right enough. Uh, so we have three 12,000 litre stills uh, within the distillery, 
Uh, and we also have a, a little 500 litre uh, still that we affectionately call Tiny 10. Uh, now, Tiny 10 actually produces the citrus heart for uh, tankery number 10, uh, but it's also an innovation still as well. So any new products that you see uh, that come th from th through kind of Diageo uh, in our portfolio, um, that they've all at some time uh, been through Tiny 10 and that innovation process uh, prior to scaling up onto, onto the bigger stalls. And one thing to this day that, that, that we do, we don't rely on technology, but when I'm in the distillery, my, my guys are in the, in the distillery producing gin, it's, it's we make the decision on that, on that cut. So there's not any automation involved in that. We make the decision on, uh, and it's all, again, it's all by nose uh, on when we're kind of cutting the heads, we're cutting the heart off the distillation, and also cutting the, the, cutting the, the tails as well. So there's a little picture, not a full picture of uh, the still. So that's, uh, this is just a, a wee snapshot of old Tom. Uh, so uh, old Tom is, is one that's been around the distillery with me for a, for a, a, a tour. Uh, I find that uh, I get very passionate when I, come, when I, when I get to that still. Um, so this date back to, to the reign of King George III in 1769. Um, it's probably one of your most flexible stills, to be honest. Uh, it produces more products than the other, the other two, uh, varying products than the other two. So, uh, and and it's, what I find, again, let's mention this word again, humbling as well, but that still uh, was one of the stills that, uh, that Alexander Gordon would have been producing or perfected uh, the Gordon recipe back in uh, 250 years ago. So, so for that still to be in there uh, and, uh, is, 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 is really uh, excellent. So the distillation, we move on to distillation. Uh, I think someone mentioned earlier on there about the, the uh, about cleaning and, and, and CIPs, etc. And uh, and that's really important when you when you're moving between different gin products, not even just different, different gin products, but when you've been from one distillation to the next, although it's the same distillation, uh, it's really important that that still is absolutely totally clean, uh, and you can see that copper sparkling. So that's really really key uh, when doing any distillations. And yes, we, we do rely on control systems, but the control systems there in Maine for safety reasons. So that's monitoring your uh, pressures, your temperatures, your flow rates, etc. So really from a, from a kind of health and safety point of view, uh, so we can, we can react and, and monitor these things. Um, but when we're charging the stills, so the distillers will charge each, ba each batch with the, the recipe botanicals, the neutral spirit, and also uh, water as well. Uh, and, uh, and, and you would think with four botanicals, so the, so the four that I mentioned earlier on there, you think oh, that would be quite simple. Four botanicals, no, no complicated, not 10, 12 or 13 botanicals. It's only four botanicals, that's an easy distillation. I can assure you, it's not easy. It's very, very difficult. And the reason it's very difficult is that you've nowhere to hide. So you get an imbalance of any of these botanicals or an imbalance of your, your, your neutral spirit or an imbalance of your water going that's still that kind of a major impact on your distillation. You won't get the character you're looking, you're looking for. So you might find this uh, that's a bit of an interesting uh, statement to make. So it's not all about the distillation. And, uh, and what I really mean by that is that there's a, so much work goes in advance of that distillation. There's a real amount of work goes on to, to ensure the, the ingredients are correct uh, and they're meeting the, 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 the character specification. Uh, because at the end of the day, as a high volume brand, uh, it can easily go wrong if, you, if you're not keeping, that, 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 the, keeping to the high quality um, uh, uh, credentials consistently. So looking at uh, quality, so, a couple of pictures up there. You can see the, the, the little mini uh, glass still, uh, and an array of them in the, in, in the lab there. Uh, but we actually uh, we do four times assess all our botanicals before they actually uh, before they actually go into distillation. And um, if I think of juniper and coriander, we actually do lab scale distillation. So every batch that we we purchase from our, our suppliers, uh, we'll assess that four times. Uh, before it actually is, is, is actually put into a charge, uh, and we do that by actually creating little 
distillates off the, the juniper batches and also the coriander batches as well. Uh, and that all goes through a, a, mainly by nose. Uh, so we'll go through a nosing process. And we do look for specific characters with Gordons. Gordons is very, very unique in specific characters. Um, I won't show you what these characters are, but there's certain things that we've picked up and, and created a, a, a bank of data uh, that we, we can refer to. And, uh, and we have a dedicated pan like nosing team as well. And um, we, we go through regular assessments on, a, on, a, on an annual basis. So the, the upfront work for me is what provides that consistency uh, and, and, and we see that, uh, that quality gin coming through all the time. And yes, we do reject 9 out of 10 uh, of our buying samples. As these guys down there all know, uh, it could be a bit of a pain. Uh, and it's in the 10 years I've been there, um, I have kind of looked at that. I've, I've, I've kind of I've, I've looked at the, kind of the, the figures we're producing on the number of buying samples received to the number of what we're actually rejecting, uh, and I honestly can't get away from rejecting nine out of ten batches. Uh, and, and certainly, uh, I, say I'm, I, I take myself as a, as a custodian of that brand, making sure every litre leaves us perfectly. I won't ever change that. That's, I'm very, very high on quality, and, and, and I make sure my, my team are as well. So, um, so yeah. It's uh, a difficult at times, uh, but um, it's the right thing to do. And with juniper berries, we actually, uh, we actually mature our juniper berries for 18 months. So when we get the, the botanicals in uh, and the Hessian sacks, uh, we do have four, four warehouses across Europe. And um, once, once they come in, uh, they're basically put in a pallet, stored in an area where there's no any direct sunlight, there's not any forced ventilation, just natural ventilation. Majority of the time, these botanicals will just sit in the dark. Uh, and we do allow them to um, mature, and just to get rid of that, that wee bit more moisture uh, from the berry. And, uh, and that really helps to intensify the oils. So when we come to a distillation, we don't do any steeping. The botanicals will go straight into the still uh, once you've got your neutral spirit and your, and your water in. Uh, and we actually start to get the real juniper character uh, coming through at a very, very early stage of that distillation. So all that work front we've done uh, and the quality check-in and that uh, ma maturing kind of period, we see the benefit at the end of the day. Not great from a bean counter point of view because there's all the average working capital, but hey, we'll know what to compromise on quality. Okay, neutral spirit, uh, it was touched on earlier on there. Um, so we do use uh, um, high quality triple distilled um, neutral spirit, green neutral spirit. Um, nosing, so every, um, we can produce it at the distillery, uh, but we also do source it as well. And every drop uh, has to go through an assessment uh, and it, mu it must pass a greater than nine out of 10 uh, nosing score. And, um, and we also do, uh, through the week, we'll do a GC analysis as well on that, on that neutral spirit. Again, it's making sure that that, that is the, the best quality spirit you've got. It's the cleanest spirit you've got to produce a, a, quality, uh, a quality gin. I've not got up in the slide there, but uh, the, the water we actually use to charge the still, um, the, a lot of our, our brands will, uh, well, not Gordon's, but a lot of brands will actually use uh, demineralised water. Uh, but supplying the site, we actually have five, bar, five boreholes. Uh, that supply the site on the whisky side and also on the gin side as well. Uh, and these, uh, the, 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 we have three that sit within the, the distillery and we've got two that actually sit in the village. Um, and uh, but believe it or not, Gordon's is actually, the, the water that we add to a Gordon's distillation is bore water. It's not demineralised water, it's bore water. And the reason for that is because, again, it takes it back to its, its heritage, whereby it was produced in London, harder water area, and there's a bit of kind of character there, and we get that character from the bore water that we, we put into the still. So again, the quality focus. So um, we really, we're, we're all about not wasting anything. Uh, it's, it's really important in this day and age that we, we, we do things like reducing carbon footprint and, and also uh, just reusing everything that we have actually uh, got in that process. Uh, so our faints, our, 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 gin, our gin faints, so we'll take our heads cut. Uh, our tails will drive down to less than 1% ABV. Uh, and once that's all collected in our, our gin faints vessel, at the moment we actually export that to a, a company in Germany and that's uh, uh, used in screen wash and I understand it's used in the cosmetic industry as well. Uh, but uh, we are working uh, a plan to actually start um, supplying to our, our bioenergy plant. So we're very, very lucky uh, within the, the Cameron Bridge site to have a, a heavily invested um, 
I think initially it was like something like 80 million pounds uh, invested by energy plant, and that takes all the spent wash from the whisky process, and it also takes the spent lees, so the spent botanicals from the gin distillation, all going, all mixed in with the spent wash from the whisky and sent up, up to our bio plant. Uh, and that bio plant actually provides us with, uh, so re reusing the, our, our spent botanicals, uh, we actually uh, generate 40% of our, our, our energy usage. Uh, so that supplies the steam to make to make gin, and um, we also we also the plant also helps recover 50% of our water usage. So, uh, right thing to do, and uh, I'm, I'm very proud to, to, to think that we actually are producing green uh, sorry producing gin with green energy. So again, the right thing the right thing to do. So I suppose to kind of summarise, um, when I was asked to do this presentation, I, I thought well. I thought long and hard about it. I thought there's really three things I want to take the opportunity. It's the first time I've been here in this, uh, this environment, and I thought, you know something, there's no very often we get a chance to showcase our people, or, and, and my team of people, and, and the people that's involved in the brand. So, so I really, I wanted to make sure that that, that did come across. Uh, and uh, so I think the people, for me, it's all about ensuring that all, everybody's aligned to the, to the kind of common goal. And that common goal uh, is about having the pride in producing a, a fantastic uh, gin. Uh, passion, um, that's about do not compromise from your quality. Again, hopefully that's come across. And it's thinking about just retain your original principles. So when you've got something good, keep it, keep it and keep working on it. Uh, and expertise, it's all about care and attention to detail through that whole end-to-end -end process and ensuring that consistent uh, character is there all the time. So, you've heard the story about Gordon from myself and, and Joe. Uh, that's a story. You're probably each writing your own stories here, or you're going to start writing your own stories on your, on your journey, wherever you go with a new gin or, or, or uh, uh, growing, your, growing your current, uh, current gin. Um, I suppose Gorns is proof that uh, um, even though you're starting at kind of humbling beginnings, if you actually kind of just keep on working at it, you'll eventually grow that brand. And, and, and Gorns has grown in 250 years to, to kind of the world's uh, number one international brand. So. Hey, we're excited for the next 250 years. <laughs> there you go, thank you.